All right, it's five past. Let's kick off. The recording has started. And with that, welcome to a hybrid mode. Finally, again, a hybrid mode. It's so nice to see so many beautiful people in the room and as well online. And Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Um, today, as usual, we're going to record the session. The recording has already started. We will make it available afterwards on our YouTube channel for those who missed it probably today. What we're going to have is, as usual, quickly overview at the last time of the future of our meetup, or nowadays called Fabric User Groups. Afterwards, I have two, three things to show. Um, what's new in Power BI? And then we have two guest speakers to talk a little bit about how you can easily create Power BI themes. And lastly, I'm going to present a little bit Git integration uh, with Microsoft Fabric. Hello, hi. Uh, how it looks like. I will not really deep dive into it, into the bits and bytes, because next month we will have Rui Romano here. Rui Romano is from Microsoft Product Group. He is the guy for integration, Git integration. So it doesn't make sense to cover in two sessions right away the bits and bytes. So I'm going to cover it a little bit high level so that everyone knows what it is. And Rui will go through next time in an hour session in more detail. As usual, if you have any kind of questions, feel free to, to drop them in the chat, unmute yourself here in the room or whatever, what suits you best. Uh, Dennis will be a little bit my co-pilot today and, and check out the, the chat in the meantime. The AI co-pilot. The AI co-pilot. Let's see who is more advanced. <laughs> All right. Um, future of our user group. Um, we already mentioned that a few times. We're going to rename it from Power BI Meetup to Fabric User Group. The reason at the end is because we have introduced Microsoft Fabric last May. Um, Fabric is, is not the new name of Power BI, but it's more a general term for different services within those Fabric ecosystem, let's say, and Power BI is part of it. And we are also uh, going this path at the end. Further, we're also going to move our whole user group from meetup.com to the official Fabric user group community website. Um, a few reasons. Uh, one of them is we want to centralize everything because we see the, the user groups for Power BI and Fabric are on this website as well. So why not leveraging these synergies and going to the same site? This is for sure one of them. What else? We're going to deprecate teams. This doesn't mean that recordings will not be available. As you see today, we're also recording the whole session, but we will just make it available on YouTube afterwards so that everyone can see it. Nowadays, it was that you have to register for Teams, GDPR stuff, blah, blah, blah. It's a little bit easier if it's on YouTube. Therefore, we're going to deprecate it, but still make the recordings available afterwards. And we're going to create an own fabric user group, Switzerland logo, and a little bit of branding around it. And this, this is an idea from, from Dennis and myself, because talking with other countries and other communities, we see that our community here in Switzerland is pretty large comparing to others. And I think it makes sense to make it a little bit more official, more beneficial, a more cool, let's say, if you have more. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, just a little bit more. What will stay? We will still highly focus on Power BI, even if you want to call us Fabric User Group. The main focus is and will still be Power BI, but it could be that we will have some other services presented. But if it's something else, it will still be the um, always in the main look of Power BI and within this Fabric ecosystem, let's say. Monthly user group calls, they will still stay every first Thursday with some exceptions. For example, in January, we're not going to do it in the first week. We're going to do it in the second week. It just makes more sense as people are most likely on leave. Um, every quarter, we try to do it an in-person or a hybrid scenario like we do today. So therefore, the next one is planned then for January. Uh, I think the 11th or something will be the Thursday, which we're going to target, but to be announced. And lastly, Dennis and myself, we're still going to lead it. And this is what. Um, uh, what, what will Sposhu sure say? For you, I, I think and mean as you are here, this is pretty clear right now that you have to join on the new Fabric community website, not through Meetup. I hope this, this works and I hope this uh, will grow in future with more members. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We created 
channel over there called Fabric User Group Switzerland, where you can find all the recordings. And the, the middle point, I have to delete that now because we got a winner. We got some ideas which I present. So the logo branding topic has been done. Lastly, the meetup.com website um, is not supported any, anymore from our side. Um, I, it's still there. I haven't deleted it, but we'll do so in the upcoming days for sure. So uh, this is not supported anymore from Tennis Guys. And same is true for Teams. It's still there. I haven't, I haven't found the time yet to delete it, but it will be deleted in the upcoming days for sure. All right. Then, as mentioned, we had a voting for new logos. As you see, we got some suggestions. And now the voting is closed. We got a pretty high number of participants, which is super cool from my point of view. And Dennis and myself, we liked it very much that the community itself voted and not that just we decided. And for this result, let me show you. This was the logo number five out of five, which the community voted for. Logo A was number four on this list. The middle place was logo B, which was like this. And I'm super, super happy to congratulate Dominic, which logo won at the end. So this will be your new logo, which we're going to use for everything related to the Fabric user group. And, and just to show you how close it was at the end as well, on the next screen, a little bit horror BI, obviously. You see that logo C1, but it was really close to logo D. And one of the reasons is if you look at the below, um, below graphic, there is always first choice red, second choice orange, and so on, and so on. First choice, so the most choices to be on number one was, for, uh, was logo C. And what I like most is there is no one who chose it as the last option. So everyone at least found it was better than something else. And the reason why logo D is so high ranked is because it, it's, uh, it has a lot of second choices for it. Nevertheless, regarding the data, it really makes sense to, to have our new logo. Let me go one more time back. Personally, I like it as well very much. Hope you guys too. All right. <clears throat> with that, let's move on with what's new in Power BI. <laughs> Not going to present so much today. Um, three new things. One is a little bit more for um, um, interesting on one hand for end users, but very important for administrators. Let me cover. We have a new, same feature, but new, um, which means generally if you save a PBX file in OneDrive for Sharepoint, until now or until this feature has been released, you always had to download it, open it to, to see the video. With this new feature, you can just click in OneDrive or in SharePoint on this PBX file and it will open up in the browser. So no need to download it. Okay, pretty cool. We updated it a little bit. And for that, we introduced, you see, it's the same name, just with updated uh, behind the scene. This one will, will be deleted just in, in the upcoming days. But if you see both, don't, don't get confused. The updated one is the one that What's here very, very important is from a data residency point of view, from an administration point of view. Technically, what it, what's happening behind the scene? If I, as an end user, click on a Power BI file, which is sitting, let's say, in OneDrive, behind the scene, a technical user is creating a personal workspace. And you will see personal workspace with a pretty large unique ID number. And in my case, now OneDrive, because I open it from OneDrive, it could also be shared. But the thing is this. This personal workspace is created really just behind the scene. I do not have access to it through UI. I just see it programmatically, either through API or, in this case, through the Audit portal. But I cannot access it through UI to log in in name of this user, for example. And what's even more important, this workspace is created in the home tenant region. This is especially important to know if you have data residency topics, like you need your power and preview capacity in Switzerland so that everything is in Switzerland stored, but your home tenant is, for example, Western Europe. This 
report will be stored in Western Europe in my case. Right? Just that you know. And this is not something that you can avoid in first place. What you can do, obviously, is to move this workspace programmatically to, uh, to a premium capacity behind the scene. But while creating it, or while it has been created automatically, it's in the first place in home reading. Just that you know, very important if this is a topic in your organization or for your customers. Any questions? Uh, first question, do you need a license? To... I think someone sent me a screenshot saying that you don't have a pro license, so you can't visualize it or something. Very good question. Uh, honestly, I don't know. I would assume yes. I would need to check as well the doc, but uh, knowing Parabia, how it works, I guess that you would require a license, but I'm not 100% sure. Only somebody knows that? No? Okay. I can check that. Mm -hmm. Another question. Once this uh, personal workspace is created, does it stay or is it removed at, at some point later? Or It will be removed. Um, oh, I'm not sure what the retention policy is. If you do not open up the report again, after I think it's seven days even, after seven days that it will be um, somehow removed. But I will need to look that up again. Yeah. Please go on. Um, is this unique per user or per file? Very good question. Per file. Yeah. So meaning if I have in OneDrive two files, it will not up, it will not end up in the same workspace. It will be two different workspaces. Yes. Why is it doing that? Very good question. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you if you want to have to refresh functionality or something like that, it, it makes sense. But five year was there already, right? The thing, well, this this uh, since we introduced the first feature, yeah. it 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 worked the same way. So we haven't changed that. But I also talked with PG and the person and the responsible um, project manager. And I also made him aware that this is a big issue here in Switzerland because of this data residency. And right now it is what it is. That's the thing. And if it's really an issue, the only thing I can recommend is pretty well. I was just wondering why it requires this space, but I absolutely agree. And I have some customers who we had to look into it, and it's a no go because they cannot guarantee that the data is in Switzerland. Even if it's in the first creation in the home region, you still, I mean, there are mechanisms. But even if it's a minute outside of Switzerland, it's an issue, right? Further questions? Enabled by default, or? Uh, yes, it is enabled by default, but you can use it. That's the reason why I'm making aware <laughs> awareness. <laughs> Do we have any questions in the chat? No, nope. nothing. Anything else? So let me move on. Another one is a little bit uh, refresh history. We did some enhancements, meaning if you go to the history feed, if you click on it, you will see now what's happening. For example, if a refresh takes longer than usual, until now, you always just see it succeeded, but it took longer. Now you can really see, okay, it tried, for example, multiple times and it completed by the fifth time, for example. And then you can check out, oh, why did it take so long? Probably network issues or whatever. So you have a little bit more details about the history and can check it out. And questions? Also available via API if you. Who haven't tested it, haven't seen it, I, I don't know. Yeah. But um, I would say yes, usually we do everything through API as well. All right. Then another one, a little bit for admins. Until now, if you, if you search for a specific um, feature which you have to turn on, turn on, uh, off, or whatever, my case was always Control F, so the web search to search for it. Now we have finally a search box at the top right on which you can search. And you can even search for, 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 uh, for example, just for preview features. Like in my case, I typed in preview and then everything which is in preview will show up, which is from my point of view, very nice. So you know what is in preview and what is not GA yet. Questions? I think that's a pretty easy one. Perfect. And lastly, just going to show that a little bit live as well. 
Uh, we enhance a little bit the mobile experience, meaning in the Power BI desktop. If you missed it, uh, think last or two months ago, we introduced a new button in the desktop where you can easily switch between mobile and desktop. And now in mobile view, you can even enhance it a little bit more or, or customize it a little bit more. For example, if you have a table, you can now in the table adjust the width, for example, and clicking on buttons and filtering and stuff like this will also now work in desktop while you are on mobile view. And how it looks like, Give it a quick click. If I go here to my Power BI report, you see it's just a simple uh, report based on sample data set. At the bottom left, if you missed that, we can now really switch to mobile view. If I do so, if I drag, for example, my table in here, a bit bigger, now I can really finally as well, let me show that you can see it. Over here, I can really now um, adjust the width as I wish, and it will stay at the end. If your table is, like in my case, a little bit too wide, too wide, I can do that and make it a little bit smaller or whatever. And another nice thing is, if I filter something, okay, cool. That looks like I missed something. Now I have no pages. All right, not sure what happened, but the idea was that I can show that if I click on some, some bar charts that it filters, now everything is filtered. <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. Question to that? Probably bookmark. Oh, oh yeah, bookmark. No, I don't have bookmarks. It's, it's a new file, it's not even saved, so <laughs> probably that's the issue. <laughs> I don't know. All right, um, that was already it from my side. Uh, I don't have any further updates. With that, I would then hand over to the team of BIPP. Right. Thanks a lot, Christian. Sure. So, uh, so you mentioned that no microphone. Uh, you don't need the microphone. You just can say share screen. Everyone should. Okay. Here you can see your screen. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, just let me introduce ourselves. So uh, I am Oscar and I am together here with Diana. Uh, together we are going to present you our uh, theme generator. Uh, basically, we are not going to talk a lot about ourselves, but uh, Diana is a full-time uh, UX designer and myself, I work full-time on business intelligence. Uh, over a year, we created this project, which his name is uh, BIP. Um, basically, we are trying to be the intersection between business intelligence and user experience. That's where we, the, the space where we are trying to be. So, uh, yeah, I will also put this at the end. Uh, you can contact us or you can uh, check our webpage at bit.pro. We also have a small uh, YouTube channel and on our LinkedIn. Uh, also, you can find us as BIP. So, we created this theme generator and probably we are in our third iteration of the theme generator. Basically, the theme generator is started as a, as a Figma plugin. It started working in Figma. Later, we did a Figma plugin and the latest iteration that we created is a web app. Uh, we have been developing this, getting very close to what is the users. Actually, we have implemented many of the changes that the users are requesting us. But we are also using other tools like heat maps provided by Microsoft Clarity uh, in order to see what is the user, what is the user actually, and how is the user interacting with, with our uh, generator. So I will also mention uh, a couple uh, comments that we have had for our team generator. Probably you know Greg Deckler. He is very well known in Power BI forces for his daily memes on that totals which are broken. Probably you have uh, seen them in LinkedIn. Uh, he, he commented, and if you search for Power BI theme generator on the web, his article will be the first one. And the thing that he mentioned is that uh, the most strike, 
in aspect of the tool is the focus on simplicity. Uh, Diana and myself, when we created the tool, actually that was, and we were very happy that Greg brought that because we said like, actually that is the goal that we wanted to achieve. A very simple yet powerful tool to create Power, uh, Power BI teams. Uh, second, uh, Inj also mentioned, uh, I tried plenty, probably you know Inj Park. Uh, he has also a pretty decent YouTube channel on Power BI and he mentioned uh, that he has tried plenty of free theme generators. And well, this one is the best. So I think that we are getting very good. No, no, I don't think we are getting very good feedback. Uh, we are still working, uh, but without any further ado, I will leave the Microsoft to uh, the microphone. <laughs> sorry, to Diana, so she can tell us a little bit more about the theme generator. Uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, then I will share my screen with you. Um, okay. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we see your screen. Okay, great, awesome. Uh, then I can uh, begin by uh, presenting first uh, maybe the importance of colors in, uh, in a dashboard, and then I will show you how to use the theme generator. So to begin, um, we, we can imagine uh, sort of like uh, the power of making an uh, unforgettable impression with, with a splash of color. And we have this example in here, uh, which, hope, uh, which hopefully caught your attention. Let me full screen it, okay. With, uh, which probably caught your attention because the, the colors are pretty bright and uh, we have a uniformity in, in this shape. And uh, yeah, indeed, design is uh, actually what creates the first impression and color plays uh, an important role to that. And even in, in the world of, of data and data visualization, um, colors are sort of like the storytellers of, of uh, your data insights. So it is good to take into consideration what colors we want to use inside our dashboard to make sure that the data that we present is easily is easily readable, uh, easily understandable by the people, and easy to interpret. And so I will move on now to showing you maybe how we would look like to have a dashboard like this one. A uh, design generated by our team generator, uh, dark theme. Um, maybe you want brighter colors and you can get something like this or go white mode with uh, this example over here or this one. Now all of these uh, palettes have been generated through the theme generator. And uh, yes, in case you don't want your dashboards to like to look like this one, uh, then uh, let's see how we can get uh, actually aesthetically pleasing dashboards that will engage our users to easily interpret our data. Great. Uh, I will move on now to the Power BI Team Generator. You can find it through our website or just look for, or you, you can also look for Power uh, BI Team Generators by BIP on, on Google or uh, on web. Uh, as long as you are connected to the internet, you, you have access to this, uh, this website. Okay, good. So in here we have a few sections. We have the top row with the colors. A second row, uh, excuse me. Okay, no. sorry. So we have the first row with the colors for our dashboard. A second row with a step-by-step -step, uh, process of uh, getting ourselves a good color palette. And in here we have the preview of what our dashboards could look like. Uh, of course, if you have the time, uh, you can click on any of these colors and use the color picker to change the colors as you want to uh, for the visualizations in here. So these main colors are the colors applied inside the bar charts, the pie charts, donuts, line charts, whatever visualizations you might have. And in here, the backgrounds, you can change the background of the cards, the text, 
color and the background of the dashboard. And uh, yes, if we were to randomly pick some colors, uh, we might end up with something not very uh, good in terms of, of the design of the dashboard. So we are going to move on to our uh, set of uh, choices that we have in here, sort of like, um, um, how do you call them, like uh, the shortcuts, yeah. These are the shortcuts that we can take. So we can select colors from coolers. And in here, I will have to enter the URL of a color palette that I like from coolers. So I am going to access the website from coolers. Uh, and in here, I can start the generator or I can explore trending palettes, but I will start the generator. And in here, I will be greeted by a number of uh, colors that I can use. And by pressing the space bar, I can regenerate as many times as I want to until I get something that maybe catches my eyes. And for instance, maybe I want to use this, these colors or the visualizations. And I can simply copy the link from up here and paste it in here. I can hit apply and now my visuals changed with the colors from colors. Awesome. Now, how do we fix the, the background? I have a few tips for that one. Um, for the text color, in case I want to work with the light mode dashboard, I will pick the darkest shade, uh, the darkest color from the main color. So for instance, I want my text to be a shade of blue. So I'm going to copy this one, go to text, paste it, and I will just have to make it darker. So the contrast is going to be uh, better between the text and the background. Uh, so that is easily uh, more readable and distinguishable from other elements. Good. Um, now let's change the background of these cards. And I can perhaps uh, paste the same color. So in here, I will paste the color, but I will make it lighter. Somewhere maybe around here. Apply. OK. And for the main background uh, of the dashboard, maybe I can go with this yellowish uh, green and paste it in here. And again, making it a bit lighter. Apply. And now I have this uh, color palette for my dashboard. And that would be one way of doing it through coolers. Of course, I can pick it how much I would want to, uh, but I'm pretty satisfied with, uh, with this result. Now, let's see what happens if I upload an image. Uh, for this one, I went on a Dribble. Uh, Dribble is a website made for uh, designers or anybody who's looking for inspiration. Uh, I have picked in here this uh, interesting animation of this cube. I really liked the, the shadows, the, the reflections, and the colors uh, that uh, are used in this animation. So I just took a screenshot. I saved it. In, on my computer and I can then come back here and browse inside. Here it is. And the main colors from that image are instantly picked up and I can apply it to the palette. So now I have these colors inside the visuals. And I will do the same tricks for the background. So I'm going to pick the darkest color, which is this blue, to apply it for the text, but make it darker like this. I will pick perhaps the lightest color, which is this shade of violet. Oops, I applied it, it's okay. And I can apply it to the card background, but make it, of course, lighter for contrast. Okay, maybe a bit more like this. OK, and I can maybe pick uh, this blue. Copy it to make it the background. And just again, for uh, contrast purposes, I'm going to make it lighter somewhere around here. 
And uh, this is a pretty clean design. I can maybe go darker, something like this. And there you go. We have our second color palette for uh, for our dashboard. Um, now maybe I don't really want to press space endlessly until I get something that I like, and maybe I don't really have any uh, inspiration, any picture that I want to test out. So I can simply go to the trending uh, button, and in here I can choose whatever is trending right now. Uh, maybe I can go for this one, and I want to test out maybe these blues which look pretty great and yeah I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with this one i can go ahead and change the background again by choosing the same colors that i have inside the main colors so the trick is that as long as the background colors are related to the main colors the balance of your design of your dashboard will be just right for for the design so i'll go back here paste this one, make it lighter for contrast purposes, and I can even play for the background, maybe something like this. How does it look? Oh, okay. And now we are inside an, uh, an aquarium or an ocean because this is pretty much the, the feeling, the emotion that I get from this uh, dashboard. All right, so this would be how uh, easy and fast you can uh, Create a color palette for your dashboards individually by playing around and picking up uh, any color that you want. You can go to coolers and search for a color palette that is generated for you. Or you can search the internet, uh, upload images and see what the main colors will give you. Or you can check the trending section. And uh, yes, now I will uh, get to uh, now we will get to the next part, which will be presented by Oscar about how you can actually get this color palette inside Power BI. Thanks, Yana. OK, thank now, you. Thank you a lot. Uh, so now let me start sharing my screen. Uh, how would you get this one into Power BI? So this one is actually the easy part. Uh, well, I, I, I would like to say that I would like to think that everything is, uh, is pretty easy to, to use, right? So once you have share, I will select the, the yeah, a palette. In this case, I don't create, I didn't create, I just select one from the trending. I will create a, a JSON theme. Uh, in here, Greg Deckler also mentioned that this was pretty sneaky from our end, but that's the only thing that we ask for uh, the email in order to generate. We promise that we don't spam anyone, but in this case, uh, once you write your email, uh, you can generate the thing that, that you were, that you are looking at, right? And I will just save it on my temporary folder. And this way, I will go to my Power BI file. By the way, we have created also here in the theme generator, we have created a, a temp, a base template, which is basically this one that you are looking at in here. OK, so this base template uh, is actually a very good place where to start your Power BI projects. Uh, myself, I always start with a base template. Uh, I try not to change colors manually and always through a team because it is it, it, it sees up the, the development process in the future. And now in here, we will only need to go to view and in view, we will go to browse for themes. And then we can search for the theme that we just created. We wait a couple seconds and then we see that everything is, is created. Now, uh, let me close this one. And do you see, or I would like to believe that our theme generator is very, very close to the look and feel of what you are looking in the, in the tool towards what you are ending up in your Power BI report. And this was something which was very important for us. So whatever you are looking at the, in the tool, that's exactly what you are having uh, on, the, on the Power BI report. Also something else that I would like to point out, and let me open here the JSON theme that it's created, is that we are not only, usually when you create themes, you could also create themes with 10 lines of code, right? including up to these data colors that we have in here. We have, I mean, this is the, the work that, a lot of work which is done, which basically we have picked up a lot of properties for most visuals 
And we have very, very carefully put the colors, the properties for each visual so you can get the feeling that you are having within the generator. If you have tried other generators, you might feel, or that was our feeling, that you feel overwhelmed by the possibilities that you have. You have so many options that you can actually modify through a theme. So we want to remove all that, all that work from the user. And that's actually what we did on the back end. So basically, you will see that I don't know how many lines of code are now any, <laughs> anymore, but basically, we have make sure that once you pull a visual, from your Power BI, from the Power BI visuals into your Canva, this already has the right properties for display. Obviously, there are there are most of the times you will need to make minor adjustments, but at least we 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 like to think that uh, you are ready to present a very very good uh, nice experience in terms of uh, the look of the Power BI grid board. So this is how the tool works. Uh, as we mentioned, it's a completely free tool. Uh, and we do have further development on, on our view. Uh, we are going to continue developing this tool. Uh, and by this final part, uh, Diana uh, will present us uh, in what we are working uh, for, the, for, the, for the next versions of the Power BI theme generator. Diana? Yes. So right here, as you can see, it's just a prototype of uh, what we are look, uh, working on. Uh, we will be improving the UI of the web page for uh, an easier access between the colors and, and the, the preview itself. Uh, now we haven't really, we are still um, working on um, furthering, uh, on further uh, improvement and we want to bring um, UX still inside uh, this, uh, this, uh, Team generator through um, other um, mediums as well. Uh, what I can say is that uh, from from here uh, we want to um, add a few more colors because right now the team generator allows you to have at most five main colors for the visuals, and we want to extend that to the number that Power BI, ha Power BI has, which is eight colors. Uh, we will also work on um, sort of uniform design, unif making it uh, easier for the users to change the background colors. Because uh, now uh, the colors that are set from coolers or you upload image are um, independent uh, for the visuals and not the background. So we are working on also making it easier for the background colors. Uh, I showed you um, in the, this preview light mode and dark mode designs. So we are working on bringing uh, that feature as well and many to come, but you should be um, keeping an eye out for uh, uh, for this uh, these updates because uh, fun things are really uh, coming in the near future. So uh, with this, uh, we. We'll ask you to um, follow us if, if you want to um, be up to date with any new features because really, really soon we will uh, add the new things. And um, I think that they are really, really helpful. So, uh, yes. Yes, Diana. Diana is being very careful in, in not spoiling, but we have a, a lot of user experience now. Probably that would be for, is there a Power Automate group? <laughs> I don't know. But a lot of the backend functionality is actually built within Power Automate and uh, messaging, uh, including into the mailing list. Even the creation of the of the theme is managed with Power Automate. So it's if someone would like to, yeah, talk about a little bit how we manage all these things. Uh, a lot of the backend is is done through through yeah my the Power Platform. Perhaps you should reach out to Luca. Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's. I don't know if there is a power platform. I think there have still the the user group, but I think once in a quarter, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it's a lot of functionality. We use it on using a HTTP requests on Power Automate. So, yeah, I don't know if there is any any question. I have otherwise a question. What are new things you plan to implement? Do you have like a list of new things you want to implement in the tool? Yes. yes. Uh, we have 
or new functionality, we, we need to be very careful because we don't want to overload this one because actually that's that's the thing that we we think that we people have has like about, about that the generator is the simplicity yeah. and the easy of use. So we're we, we have had many many requests, many things that uh, would be nice, but it will be impacting us. Now we have chosen four of them and we will be releasing them. Uh, we, we just don't want to spoil them. If you want, uh, once this is over, <laughs> well, I can tell you a little bit more, but, <laughs> but we are going to understand. But these, these are one, four of them, and I I, I, I love one of them, but uh, especially one of them, but they are all pretty nice, I believe. All of them uh, also from the users. We are also using a tool which is called Microsoft Clarity. We can discuss that to view the, the heat maps yeah, we actually, Diana spent a lot of time analyzing how people was using our theme generator, and we use heat maps and and, uh, and recordings. This is our anonymous recordings on to see how how everything is used. So this is why, for example, the UI we decided uh, to move the buttons to the left because we saw like people is uh, scrolling a lot up and down, up and down to see the colors and so on. So yeah, in any case, I am deviating from the from the from the Power BI Fabric user group. Uh, yeah, please try the generator. Uh, it's for free, uh, and we will be uh, further developing this. Do you plan once I download a template and I wish to do adjustments? Do you plan to upload my existing one? <laughs> yeah, that that has gone through our through our mind. That was gone through through our mind. Uh, not sure yet. Okay. Not sure yet. Uh, again, it's part of the. I, we believe that the functionality that we are adding should be enough, but but there are other tools that can can handle those kind of uploads and be a lot more granular in the terms of how you use them, right? So you can go and really be very very granular. Writing a Power BI theme is not the easiest thing, I would say. Uh, well, with the new schema validator, uh, it's, it's way easier. I don't know if you have tried the new schema validator. Uh, but it's way easier to write a Power BI theme. But still, there are like so many properties that you can dig in. So I'm not sure if we are. Uh, the, the same happens with fonts. Fonts depend if the user has installed the font in the computer or not. It's not all one size fits all in Power BI fonts. It's kind of tricky yeah. that one. So we we decide not to implement fonts, for example. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Diana. Thank you. Thank you. Let's you check it out. <clears throat> Just a second to take over. Thanks very much. One more time, Oscar and Diana. Um, was pretty, pretty cool to see an easy theme generator. Now, the next topic of today is um, the journey of fabric that we promised uh, that we're going to deliver until the end of, of this, this year. And uh, the last three parts was more about generic stuff and then how to build a leg house, uh, what is direct leg mode. And now we're going to talk a little bit more in the Let's say in depth, high level in depth about Git integration. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Git, I just have a few slides to make you familiar with it and what the purpose of it is. And for that, I remembered. <clears throat> okay, one second. One second, my tool doesn't work here. Oh, there we are. I remember back when I went to school, and especially when I had to do some school projects. So working together on a, on a, on a thesis or whatever. And I don't know about you, but it started with, okay, we have one word file called group project or whatever. Then after a while, you got the second one, oh, group project new. And then you go, no, no, it's group project final. And then you go further and you copy and copy and it's always like new, new, the real new, the real new final and so on and so on. And 
I think everyone who's laughing knows knows this pain, and this is not just with with in school. It's the same with especially in coding development stuff, but as well with Power BI reports, as well with Excel sheets. You always make a copy and say final version version two dot zero whatever. And the issues are obvious. Um, multiple users uh, creating multiple um, multiple documents in this case and really working on one and the same document is a little bit an issue because you always have to check which one is the real original one, the real final one, and working on that probably it's also an issue to not simultaneously uh, working on the same one. It's, it's not every tool allows that. Tracking changes is another thing. I mean, looking from a Word perspective, Office Word, it is possible to track changes, but once you go through, you can uh, accept it or decline it or whatever the term is. But once done, there is no real history of what has changed like one month ago or the last time you did so. This is like the third thing that I listed here to see this. This is exactly more or less where Git helps. So instead of creating multiple copies and renaming it and saying this is the real final, the real, real final, you have one document or one code, one report, one Excel sheet. And within this one thing you can create, let's say you can just focus on one specific chapter and say that you are responsible for chapter number one and your colleague is responsible for chapter number two. And you can create in Git term branches to really simultaneously work on the same code, on the same report, on the same document. You can even go further and say, even if you created a so-called branch, and in this case, going for a chapter number two, even there you can track changes, do so, and so on. And once you wish to finalize it, you can, again, in turn, merge those things again into the same group project document, into the same report, into the same code that you have. This way you can make sure that there is always, like let's call it one single set of truth that everyone has access to, you can create multiple branches to work on different kind of sub-scenarios or the whole project if you wish, but usually you create uh, you create such branches just for some small sub-codes, let's say, and then you merge it once you see it should be done or it's finished. And this is exactly what you can do with Git. So you, you most likely you see such kind of pictures when somebody is explaining Git. It, it means nothing else than you have a project, like a document or a code or whatever. You create this kind of branches that you that you have, and on the line at the end, you can always merge those and have it in your single source of truth. Let's call it. Questions so far? Because this is the essential thing of Git at the end. Doesn't sound complicated, but it can be. And then on the other hand, what is GitHub? Um, GitHub is the platform which allows you to work in a Git manner. So uh, meaning you can through GitHub uh, save your projects, for example, save your code or whatever, and then really have this Git uh, possibilities of having merges, having your main branch and so on uh, to, to, to work on your code. And it's the, I think, the world widest and most popular um, platform to work on. With, uh, with Git at the end. And in my case, what I do is working with Git. I, I have it in Visual Studio Code in this case, where you can also easily integrate, meaning I'm on my laptop opening Visual Studio Code. I enable Git and everything I do, all the changes are automatically tracked, and multiple people can work on it simultaneously. And why I'm telling so is because Power BI is now Git enabled, finally, after so many years. This was, from my point of view, one of the most missing feature and one of the most requested features in the last years, because it was always a pain if you work in desktop that multiple users or multiple developers can work on the same project, on the same data set. Data set, it's a little bit of exception, there has been ways, but really on the same, um, on the same report, it was an issue until now. And for that, we created a, a new file format as you can see, PBI P, P stands for project in this case. So it's a Power BI project file format. You can read more here on the link if you're interested in and how to save it. It's pretty easy. If you open your report in Power BI Desktop, you just say save as and you will see 
a new PPIP format, which I will show just in a second. Once this is done, <coughs> you will create uh, two folders. I'm going to show that one for data set and one for the report. The folders have some subfolders and stuff. Not so important right now what exactly it is or what it has. At the end, it just means uh, we differentiate behind the scene even between data sets and reports to track all the changes that can be done within our report. I think, yeah, well, just going to present it as a high level overview how to set it up. Um, in my case, if you wish to have the full experience, and full experience means I create, for example, a report in Power BI Desktop, make it Git enabled, and I publish it to Power BI Service. That in Power BI Service, I can also track changes. And even if I change something in Power BI Service, that it can go back to Power BI Desktop without me downloading manually the whole report and so on. And to do that, you would require Azure DevOps. Because we go through Azure DevOps in this case, not through GitHub, but the principle of Azure DevOps in GitHub is, let's say, the same or, or pretty similar. To be able to do that, you see four main steps. First is you need to save your report as PBIP file. You have to create a Git repo in Azure DevOps. You have to enable the source control on your folder where this PBIP file is saved. And you have to first uh, publish the branch. So that you have the branch in Azure DevOps. Once done, you connect it with your workspace, in Power BI Service, the whole Azure DevOps, and you're done. I'm just gonna show that the whole process so that you see how and what it means. Yes, please. Sorry, questions. <laughs> yes, here's a thing that I find out regarding the DevOps mm -hmm. kit and the DevOps kit and the Power BI workspace that you have to enable it enable mm -hmm. they need to be in the same geography if not if they don't work this is true if you're if they are not in the same geography then you cannot connect the kit to the yep. to the workspace this is true having that devops that, to the workspace sorry. Yeah. so this means um what, what oscar just mentioned the the devops that you create the kit in in devops it has to be in the same region you have you can choose um where the the is it organizational project i think the organization is and it has to be in the same uh, um region that uh, like the workspace and, and that is for for example for us is an issue because our premium capacity is in switzerland but the tenant is in the states so we cannot create this functionality i see i see right now it's it's in uh, public preview yeah. and such kind of feedback is very important. The best would be if you can, in the community itself, just write it back to, to the preview. Mm -hmm. and uh, have a look at it and then take it up. Because I'm sure other customers, or many customers, especially here in Switzerland, will have the same issue. Yes, that we have to be in premium capacity. That's a legal requirement, right? Yeah, I can imagine. There are already, are there already plans for enabling it with uh, other source control tools other than uh, Azure DevOps? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> How, I mean, I can argue in both worlds. On one hand, we say, yeah, uh, we're open and everything. On the other hand, I can also understand that we want to, to secure a little bit that you come to the Azure group. So I really don't know which way we're going to go. I haven't seen anything on the road paper. So right now, it's Azure. There are way at least to use it partially, like the PB, PBP file to use it maybe with other version control or you. That's for sure. Use. Yes. So if you have another version control system, what you can do for sure, let's say I go with GitHub instead of Azure DevOps, then the integration between GitHub and the desktop file is there. And everything I do, every change I do is tracked and in GitHub. But then I need from GitHub. Ah, for GitHub, got to know it. She read it not for GitHub. She always get it not for GitHub. Right, thank you. <laughs> um, then we need to programmatically take it from GitHub on our own and create our own tool or whatever to publish it then to, to Power BI. It's possible. I mean, Power BI has these uh, REST APIs and, and everything, but you need to set it up on your own. If you're developing like locally, it makes sense, but you cannot push it into the service naturally like you can do it with devops right that's the big yes. that's that's like so you could still be having a source control with your your files and 
mark and, and in GitHub, but you cannot push it to to the service. Yeah, not so easy. I mean, you, you, yeah. you well, not so easy. Either. Yeah, you have to create your own let's call it pipeline, mm -hmm. which you have to trigger to push it to the workspace. And I'm, ju I'm just going to show it. If you go through DevOps, it's just by clicking on a button and you're done. Mm -hmm. That's that's the biggest advantage. There's one question from the chat. Uh, Kelly Richards is asking, how do we get access to Microsoft to a Microsoft Fabric workspace? Right. Um, three ways. Uh, a little bit depending as well on your policy internal, but let's say from a Microsoft point of view, what we offer is either you have Power BI Premium. If you have a premium workspace, you can already do Fabric. If the Power BI admin allows that, there is a tenant setting which you have to enable to be able to create artifacts, fabric artifacts within a workspace. The other way would be um, you can also go for Azure service. So they log into Azure portal. There you have an Azure service called Microsoft Fabric, which you can just enable and then um, assign to the workspace and it's fabric. And the last thing is that's what I do, for example, for my demo right now. You can also uh, go for a trial license. Microsoft Fabric trial license, which is valid for 60 days. Um, we didn't, we don't count it yet, but once we're going to count, it's then valid for 60 days. Yeah. Nowadays, they it's just updating every day. Ah, is it? Yeah. Okay, so it's not every day. Okay, so I missed that part. I think it was 1st of October, but I just saw that I still have 59 days. So, <laughs> okay, so I think since 1st of October, we count it now. Well, but to be fair, as an addition, the Git integration is not bound to Fabric. It also works with any premium workspace. Yes, I think so. Yes. You don't need fabric. You can no. use it with a premium or premium to use over yes. space. Yes, you don't true. need fabric. Yes. That's true. That's not a fabric requirement. Yeah. Any other question from the chat, from the team? No. All right. Then let me go through. Let's see if we can make it work. <clears throat> I will really start from scratch. Hope I remember. All right. Um, what we have. I have here a Power BI file. I usually use this uh, standard report, nothing special. And what I'm going to do is on my OneDrive, I'm just going to create a new folder to make sure I have it just in this folder. I'm going to call it Fabric User Group Grid, grid, grid Git Integration. And in there, uh, I'm going to save now my file, saying save as. You are and browse this device a bit easier. Paste it. And instead of PBIX, as you can see, I go and save it now as PBIP file. Once done, you are. <clears throat> Once done, there are a few things to, to see. As mentioned, we have two folders, one for data set and one for report, in which we have the schema at the end and some meta information and so on. We have a git ignore file. Um, what you can do, for example, is if you wish to save it as a project, but don't wish that git tracks it right away, you can configure this file to ignore your current report, and then all the changes that you do will be ignored. This case. That's what the, the, um, this file is, is for. And lastly, we have our PBIP file over here, which you can open as you see with Power Desktop, and it opens like every PBIX file as well. Right. Once this is done, let me go to Azure DevOps. Right here, I have my organization called PBI Guide. Uh, I have already a, a project through which I went to test it. Um, let me, in this case, create a new one. So I just hit here, create new project at the top right. I'm going to call it Photo Surprise User Group. Private, same OK. Seconds, but once created, we have our, uh, our project created for Git integration in this case. Lastly, let me also create a new workspace. So I'm here in Power BI workspace. I say here new. I say fabric user group Switzerland. And 
under advanced. I make it a trial. This is OK. It's hitting apply. So it's really a new workspace, as you can see. Now, what I have to do is I have to enable git enable my folder in which my Power BI project file is stored. To do so, I use Visual Studio as mentioned. In there, I make my life pretty easy. I do, I do two things. I'm right now here at the file section in which I can add different kind of um, folders so I can quick access those things. And I'm just going to add now my new created folder here. Right clicking, saying add folder to workspace. And I paste folder from previously and hit add. Yes, I trust. And you can see this is just an explorer more or less. Uh, this is the folder in the folder. I have two of the subfolders. I have my git ignore like previously and my pbip file. So this is more or less just an explorer. Um, which makes my life a little bit easier to, to see stuff. And for example, if I go to the data set subfolder, if I open up here the config JSON file, you see it's a JSON file and you see what's behind. This is more just for easy and quick access. What I can do now is on the left hand side, I have here this, let's call it git sign, if I, or source control sign, right? In there, if you open it for the first time and haven't Git enabled anything, it will be a little bit different. You will have a button which says um, initialize. 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 Thank you very much. Yes, this is the initialize button which you click on. You select your folder and you're done. Uh, in my case, because I have already one folder called Git integration, I have to go to the three dots here at the top right to do the same. So to do so, let me click. Okay. Oh. Where was it? Right. So, oh, where was the button? Sorry, it's the ah, here it is. Sorry, I missed the three dots. It's at source control, obviously the three one. And what I can see. Okay, one more second. Where is it? Oh, there was also through UI. Okay. Not going through UI, we can also go through the command line at the top. It. Like Teams is showing me. Look at that. Teams is showing me at the top the command line, which I cannot get rid of. Just more, one more second. I know I can hide. Do you remember Oscar probably or someone that I think there was always this button? I tested it. I know that you can just add a new one. Or for what? What are you uh, just a, a, a new folder for for what? Sorry for that. OK, what you can do as well, not sure where the button is, can't find it anymore. But what you can do is you can also go through the command line saying git and there is this initial initialize repository command. If you open it, it will ask you for all the folders that you see through the Explorer. And in my case, I just got for the fabric user group git integration. I select it. And then after a few seconds, you will see on the left hand side that my new folder is now here and it's initialized. What I can do now is quickly check if I go to the Azure DevOps on the left hand side to repos. I don't see anything right now as I haven't pushed or published any file, any folder or anything. Therefore, what I see is just a, um, let's say a URL where my repo is sitting. And I need to combine this with my local Visual Studio repo app. Now to do that is I just copy this URL, go back to Visual Studio. On the folder itself, on the three dots, I say, where is it? Where is it? 
find it? Ah, oh, no, it's now taking for sure. Always good if I can find things. Sorry for that. Um, control. Ah, there it is. Remote. This is what I'm looking for. I can now say add remote, which means I am adding this URL to push all my changes and everything then into into the Azure DevOps Git repo. To do so, I provide the URL now in the command line. I hit enter. I have to give him a name so that he knows with what I'm connecting to. I'm going to call it Fabric User Group Switzerland. And if I hit enter, just to quickly show where I am, see over here, this is where I am right now, just giving now a name. You always see a little bit of description down below what you have to do. Once this is done, hitting enter takes a few seconds and Make it big screen again. You will get a successful message here at the top, and now I'm connected with my repo. But just because I'm connected, I still don't see any files or anything. I have to commit my changes, and to do so, let me go back to Visual Studio one more time, and you see already here my button, which I can commit. I can always write a message like, "This is my first commit." Or whatever. So use this text box to add comments so that you know what you're doing or whatever, and then just hit the commit. Do so. I say yes, I want to commit that. Publish my first branch. So it's creating now everything what I need to do. You always work in a branch. If you don't create sub branches or whatever, um, it's called main. Previously it was master, then we go with a more political way, calling it main nowadays. And in the main, this is this it's is real. The, the, yeah, for it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is now uh, your main single source of truth, let's say. And obviously, if you wish, you can then create branches to go with chapter one, chapter two, as as I as I mentioned. And this is no joke. We really go from more political correctness instead of master, we're calling it main. It's not a joke. <laughs> All right, because I did so, let me go back to my repo here. If I refresh now, once refreshed, you see now exactly the same structure as we saw previously. The two folders, my git ignore and my pvip file. All right, so the first circle is done, meaning if I do now changes in Power Desktop, this will be recognized and I can always push them now to my repo. For example, let me show that. If I go in here to Power BI and let me just take a KPI revenue and if I multiply it by two, once this is done, it takes just a few seconds and Do you have to save or? I have to save. Forgot to save almost. Once saved, there we are. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have here now an indication we have one change, and the change can be seen here is in the model.bim file, so in our data set at the end. And if I select that, we already see where exactly the change is. On the left-hand side, old version, right-hand side, new version. And having a deeper look, the multiplied by two is now added at the right. And what I can do is, again, I can add a comment like multiplying by vector to my measure or whatever, hitting commit, wish, and this change is after syncing. It's always a few seconds, but after syncing, the, it will be available in my Azure DevOps Git as well. Here, if I would open your data set, 
if I would open here my model BIM file. OK, now I have to search. What was it? Revenue inclusive tax. Or can I search by multiply by two? Yes. Searching for it, you see in my model.bim file, the expression is here. It has synced. So this one circle, this first step is OK. Now we have to go from this Azure DevOps kit to Power BI that this syncs as well. Now to do so. One question. Oh, yes, please. From uh, Meinrad, can you also change the code in Visual Studio? Yes, you can do that. I'll show that during the whole process, but I can also go now in, in Visual Studio. Let me do that right away. And if I open up again through Explorer, if I go to my model, if I search now for multiplied by two and I delete that. Multiplied by three. Multiply by three, all right. If I save that, obviously I see again a change. I again multiply by three, commit. At this point, the Power BI file is not. Yes. Yeah, just going to comment on that. And sync, so this is the same, but and this is. This is not a big but, but you have to know it. In Power BI Desktop, the change is not there yet. If I go to my revenue, oh, there we are, you see it's still multiplied by two. This means I have to reopen Power BI Desktop. I have to close it and reopen it, and then I will see the multiplied by three factor. Let me do so. If I go in here, if I open the PBIP file, and while this is opening, question. Is it uh, expected that there will be some button in Power BI that will kind of refresh? No. Okay. No. It, it, you really need to close the file. Yeah. Not sure if you're going to update that. In some case, I would love that I have like an indicator in the file itself saying like sync. Would love that. Not sure if you're going to do that. Yeah. Does it mean that now if we can see the code of the data set and maybe also of the visualization, that I can just give, for example, a tool ChatGPT and get documentation out of it? Very good question. I think yes, why not? I haven't tested it, but I think so. I mean, ChatGPT at the end would understand. It's just a JSON format, more or less. Yeah, worth a try. We can do that probably afterwards at the end. <laughs> you can. But you can do something is called with monkey tools. Mm -hmm. Monkey tools, you can actually get all the metadata of your Power BI report and document it. And Brian Julius is doing amazing things with monkey tools and chat GPT. Okay. The DAX, once you once you give the context to chat GPT, the context of the model, the DAX that it writes, it's scarily accurate and very comp very complex DAX. Monkey monkey.com or monkey tools. Just search monkey tools and it, they, they they have something that which is called model sloth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but that's a good one. Also, uh, a hint from uh, Georg uh, Evalin uh -huh. um, about the thing you mentioned that it has to be in the same region. There is actually an admin setting that you can activate. Users can export items to Git repositories in other ge geographical locations. When you activate it, it works. Oh, thank you very much. Didn't know that either. Cool. Thanks. And to finish the previous one, you see now after reopening it, I see the multiply by three factor now. Now to have the full circle, going back to the wrong browser, going back to my <laughs> real browser. <laughs> um, we have now to link DevOps with the Power BI workspace. To do that, I switch to Power BI. I go here to my newly created workspace in the workspace settings. I have here integration and in there I have to choose my organization if you guy in this case I have to choose my project which is now user group choosing my git repo again user group and my branch and because I haven't created a new one there is just this main one and now I say connect and sync these are the four required fields once done takes probably a minute or so 
to really do the sync. And as you already see, it's really syncing my report and the data set, right now the data set, into the workspace automatically. In my case, let me stand up quickly for that. In my case, because I haven't got any reports in the in the workspace, it's pretty easy, so it knows I have just to sync what is in the game. If I would have any artifacts in there, I would get a message like, hey, what do you wish? Do you wish to overwrite? Do you wish to overwrite workspace? Or do you wish to push to the GitHub what you have in here? And you can then you can push to the GitHub. I think you can. What you already have in the workspace, push it to the GitHub. Just reports. Just reports and data sets, not everything else. No, but I think they extended it now also with either dashboards paginated. or paginated. Yes, exactly. Paginated. Paginated was. So now, but the new artifacts will come over time. Yes. But I, I, I would need, we can check afterwards again if you everything can push or just reports or so. But for sure, you I would get a message if I would have something in the workspace asking what I wish to do. You can show it also if you change something. Yeah, yeah I'm going to show that. But but what you thought is if I have a workspace with three different reports and now I'm connecting to a bit with just one bit, what happens? You know, will the two reports be deleted? Will all three be deleted? And a new one is coming. You know, and for that you get a message, but I can check what exactly you can do. And for a PBIP file, does it matter if it's direct query or import mode, or it doesn't? And it's the BIM file that you have, the BIM file defines. There's also a question from Mohammed. He raised his okay. hand. Please ask your question. Hi, Christian. How are you? Hi, Dennis. So I see that in our examples that uh, Fabric user groups user land uh, uh, workspace is a premium capacity. Is it is it required to be a premium capacity? It is required to not be in pro, meaning premium for use of premium. Yeah, yeah. In trial. <laughs> yeah. So, OK. <laughs> and of course, uh, the user need to be also premium per user at least. Yeah, if you go with premium per user workspace, then yes. So it's not useful. Yeah. If you just, just have a premium workspace, then you need a pro license. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And there is any pre request like, uh, uh, for example, app registration to do it uh, before we start? To no. Use, uh, no. No, no, so like what? through the whole thing. So all you need is Azure DevOps in my case. If you wish yeah. to integration Azure DevOps, you need a project at the end and you need a workspace backed up by a capacity. Okay. When, when you did the initial, uh, uh, when you initiate the, the folder in Visual Studio, mm -hmm. if this means that uh, each time I need to create, a, I need to use Visual Studio. Do I need to do any change after I do this initial initialization, or it will not impact on the Visual Studio if I would like to write a code for Python or whatever? Because well, once you do your changes in Power BI Desktop, those changes will be recognized once Git enabled. But you have to commit or publish these changes then to your Git repo. And to do so, I'm using Visual Studio. But if you or Visual Studio Code, but if you have another tool, also fine, as long as it understands Git and the source control. But you have to do it in a in a in a uh, in a tool because out of Power BI, just because you did some changes, it will not automatically from desktop sync with Git in this case. Make sense? Thanks. Thanks. So, then let me go back to Power BI service. Two or three cool things to show. First is, let me create now a report on top of my data set. Just an easy one. Go in here, saying create from scratch, some whatever. Go with uh, what can I do? City. Ah, I need to refresh. Okay. I need to refresh my data set. That's the reason. Save. Once you obviously, once you have your data set in there, uh, the credentials and stuff hasn't been set up right now. So I need to first refresh that. So let me go here into the settings. Uh, credentials are here. That's very good. From my other workspace, let me refresh that. Hope that takes a few seconds. 
<coughs> so when you do a Power BI project, it means that it only uh, kind of transforms the metadata. Yes. So the data is not uh, not the data itself, because in the in the file in the PBIP file, um, yeah, it's only metadata because you have the dot bim file and not the data itself. And once you did it, I, as you see, I have to first refresh it. Then I can show the cool stuff. Because what I'm going to show is I can now create a report in the service. I will do some changes on my existing report as well in the service. And at the top right, you see, let me put it on the, on the video. At the top right, you see source control over here, and you see an indicator of how many changes you have. And once we did some changes, it will obviously show one to whatever. And then we can we can really control. Do we wish to sync? What do we, what do we wish to sync? Once done, it will be in Azure DevOps Git, and from there I have to sync my Git locally. But it's will work, and I will have it then in the desk. Two people's working on the same thing. Will it create a conflict on Git? Um, that needs to be resolved. A little bit depending how you're going to work on it, um, but it's it's. At the end, it's always Git. If I create branches, and you can then push the branch into the main one, you know, and you can then decide which changes you want to take. If you're really going at the same time, not not sure what's going to happen. Usually, you have a conflict. Like when you when two people change the same yeah. measure, you see a conflict. If Christian is changing measure A and you're changing measure yeah. B, usually it will merge them, but it will ask you because it's the same file. But I don't probably you will say this later with the change of the structure to Timdle. There will be less conflicts because there are more files in those. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So still refreshing. Okay, well, this is refreshing. Let me do some changes then on the Power BI report the existing one first. So in the service itself, if I go into here, <coughs> obviously I have no data, but still I can, for example, delete here a visual that at least will work and just save again. This report has saved. If I go to my, if I go now to my workspace, we see two things. First, the red indication, hey, we have one change. And the next one is git status. It's uncommitted. So you know now which artifacts are already synced with git and which one has changed and, and hasn't been committed right now. And uncommitted means I did a change like we did now, and it hasn't been committed to the Git. And if I select now source control, we see exactly what has changed. And I can obviously select it and say commit, and it will do so. Or I can so also say undo, meaning I go to my previous stage. So I would not have to commit my changes, probably I did something wrong or whatever. I can always go and say, can you create another branch? I can also create another branch from here, meaning uh, check out new branch, and then it will create a new branch and calling it chapter one, whatever, and it will then push it into my new branch in this case. Uh, and also we can add com uh, commit uh, message in case we need to revert, correct? This is something uh, for the team to understand what we need. Yeah, I, I haven't heard it so well. Do you mean the uh, commit messages? So this is the comments. Yes. yes. Yeah, the commit message. This is when you do the change. You would you explain that you already delete the the button or you delete the the table or whatever the change you did. So as the team can understand what you did, is it correct? This is yes. this is the reason for this message or? Uh, yes, exactly. You can say okay. you deleted top right visual, for example. In, in case you would like to get another version or you would like to go back for the previous version, so. Right. And we have another tab here. If you haven't seen it, updates, meaning if I click on it, there would be updates if I would see any anything pending. And if I'm not wrong, I can also somehow see the changes. No. Uh, while this is still refreshing, let me commit this. Takes again a few seconds to commit, and now it says synced, meaning in my repo it's synced. Going back to Visual Studio, in there again, 
Oops, sorry. Source control, fabric. I can say here a refresh. No, it's not refresh. Sync this one. Yeah, synchronize changes. Small little button over here. And this will get the changes from Git or Azure DevOps in this case. And once done, again, I have to reopen my Power BI desktop file to get the changes. So don't save in this case. Going back here. Open it. Work. No purpose. While this is opening, let me check my data set. Still refreshing. All right. At the end, what I try to show here is if I would create a new report here, obviously source control would see that as well. I can commit it. If I sync then through Visual Studio Code, in this case, my repo with my folder on locally folder, I will have the PBIP file as well. And I can open it then in desktop. So everything I create in or not everything, but every report I create now in the service can also be synced uh, uh, to my local file and I can just open it in Power BI Desktop, do my changes and sync it back. This is the whole full story, um, which I try to show once the data set has refreshed. And in the meantime, desktop is still opening. Perfect time for asking questions if you have any. <laughs> I, mean, um, I, I expect there to be something different happening in if you activate Git because it then should see everything as this project file so you can sync it. Has this, this update any impact on how different workspaces operate like globally or is it just for these separate um, Git enabled workspaces and the behaviors naturally the same? Oh, you mean behavior or what kind of behavior you mean? Um, mainly performance. Okay. So, um, for the report itself, is it stored? If the report is stored in a Git enabled workspace or not? Yes. Yes. For example, for um the the refreshes, um, if I do some changes, how the the processing then works? If it's longer because it has to translate within the service. Something like that. I haven't heard anything about performance improve or decrease or issues or whatever. Uh, I mean, at the end, I don't have yet so much experience with it as in just a new feature at the end, but I don't think there will be differences if you git enable the workspace or not, because technically it's another stream refreshing your data set, accessing your data set, then doing the git stuff. And yeah. therefore, I'm not expecting the differences there. Oh, thank you. Do you have on your PVIP project, you have different objects for report or model, right? Make a change on the report layer, on the layout layer, and you commit and push it. This should not change the data set, it's only changing the viewing. So you should not refresh the data set. Whilst if you refresh the data set, or you do changes on the data set and you commit them, in this case, do you need to refresh the data set? Let me test. Once my refresh has done, we can test it. Um, I would say yes, how I understand the data set, because it has to recalculate it, you know. But I'm not 100%, or do you know that? It depends, as always. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, for example, only add a new measure in the data set, it's not triggering a refresh as far as I know. That's like what you had in the, how was the tool called of Christian Wade? Uh, um, the tool that was doing the differences. Yeah. Oh, the yeah, ALM toolkit. ALM toolkit. Thank so you. there you had also the option to only commit the changes that don't trigger a refresh. For example, if you had a new measure, it's not triggering a refresh data set. If, of course, you change relationships, add a new column or table, it has to reload everything if you have a new column. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the same here. Actually, I didn't uh, try it, but I'm pretty sure it's the same here, especially now with uh, Tindle that you break it down to different measures. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my understanding of it. But to be fair, I didn't test it either. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. But in this case, with incremental refresh, uh, it can be tricky. 
Well, if you enable increment to refresh, yes. Would need to test at the end. I, I haven't tested all scenarios, it's as you see, but very good questions for Rui next month. <laughs> yes, <laughs> write them all down. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for sure we can ask Rui. Uh, he has, I would expect the answers for that. In the meantime, my desktop has finally opened and you see the top right visual has gone. So haven't done it on my own. It's really coming then from this thing that we did. And therefore all the changes in the service can be synced to my desktop at the end. Uh, my refresh is still going. So I hope that I can show you as well how I can create a report and can sync it, but- no, uh, failed. <laughs> Thank you. All right, always the demo gods are always <laughs> against me. Just okay. up, uh, gateway or something. No, no, it's a public one. Probably, probably the IP is blocking. That, that could be the case that my uh, IP is not open for that. A network related, yeah, yeah. okay. Gersha, the attention. Your uh, computer is not connected to the charger, the attention. Yes, thank you very much. Um, thanks very much. I, I have still half an hour or so, but that, that's enough. And nevertheless, uh, I hope you can at least imagine how it will work. It's absolutely the same process. If I would create in the service on my, uh, on my data set, uh, report, I can sync it through Azure DevOps, I can sync it uh, down to my local machine and I will have it available, do changes if I wish, and sync it back. Can I have this functionality also with other Git tool uh, with APIs if I build my own solution? Oh. I mean, what you can do, if I would go with GitHub, for example, and um, I can do more or less the same, meaning I can push or I can sync with GitHub automatically, but from GitHub into the workspace, I don't have this automatic configuration, like in my case, because this source control at the top right that you see in the workspace, this is coming because of Azure DevOps. Uh, if you wish to use another tool, you can do so, but you would need to add it uh, on your own and create your own workflow to sync workspace with your tool. The API is available, it's not possible to go back like to, to do from Power BI service to Git, to GitHub. Um, I mean, through Pavia service, you can download the, the files and so on, and then push it into the Git repo. It would work, but there are a lot of effort at the end. Uh, I, I've checked for a REST API to um, actually upload from a PBI project file. Um, I haven't found one, so am I the issue, or do I have to create a PBIX and upload this one there? Uh, good, good one. Don't know, don't know. Um, I would assume that you can use the same REST API like the PBIX file, use it and just push your PBIP file. Wouldn't that work? Oh, I think the API takes only PBIX. Yeah. Takes it only PBIX? Okay. If this breaks, you need to have then a local machine which runs Power BI. Yeah, I see. I see. Theoretically, you could take all the files and pack them, zip them, and that would be a PBIX file. Yeah. In theory, well, I, what you could do is you could use PBI tools. That is from Matthias Tierbach. He also showed it in our user group. Yeah, sure. And deploy it to the XML A endpoint, but this needs premium. And then the question is why to do all the hassle, then you can anyway use this. So all the solutions don't really work. Yeah, but XML A, you only have the data set that's not the repo. True. PBI tools actually. No, no, PBI tools also publish the report. Oh, does it? No, okay. if you want to say that. Uh, there, or uh, he is working as well as uh, for uh, to build from um, project files directly to PBIX, so you don't need to have premium. Then, then you can just push it, but not yet. Okay. In the end, public preview. I'm sure we're gonna follow up and enable it, but not so soon as that, I guess. <laughs> All right. And um, with that, I'm already done more or less. Any further questions regarding Git, Git integration? The chat, anything else? Nothing more. In Azure DevOps is free, right? Or, or do you need a license? Buy for free after that. You yeah, it's, it's something like this. A few users are free and then you need a license. Yeah. All right, uh, then let me finish up. Yes, it works. Demo time is done. Uh, as usual, two links if you want to learn more about Microsoft Fabric. MVPs, we have a good list over there. And a few of them you should recognize as we had them as well in our, uh, in our user groups, like Nikola and some others. Uh, Fabric blog to, to check out the latest and greatest. 
And for our next user group, as mentioned, we will have the great Rui Romano joining us, who will talk about developer experience in Power BI. So really the Git integration, the deep dive. I showed you a little bit overview, hope it was okay, but he will go a little bit more into the details and such kind of questions we got today, for sure a good source to ask. The next one will be on the 2nd of November, same time, 4 till 6 p.m. Thursday. And lastly, it's in online mode this, uh, this time, so really via Teams, not hybrid. The next hybrid is planned for January. We will announce today. With that, thank you very much. This is Dennis dancing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's definitely not. Looks worse when I dance. <laughs> I'm also not a dancer, but thank you very much for being here, listening in. And lastly, probably a question, especially to the ones who joined via Teams. Is the timing an issue to be on site or what is the issue to be to have more people on site? Because we would love to really connect again. And if you have to move it probably to 5 p.m. or whatever, let us know. Give us feedback so that we have, can have more people on site the, uh, the next time. Also now happily in the chat, just write your thoughts. Yes, please do so, really, please do so. And yeah, with that, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of today. <clears throat> Thank you. Have a good Thank day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.